Five Live Formula One. Adrian, thanks for talking to us. Um, how do you reflect on this incredible year at Red Bull? Uh, with a bit of surprise, I suppose, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, obviously, this year's car was an evolution of last year's, uh, which first half of last season, obviously, in the tight battle of Ferrari, we started to edge away a bit in the second half of the season. But we fully expected this year that everything would tie close up. Um, second year into a stable set, pretty stable set of regulations. So to have the advantage we've had this year was totally unexpected. It's supposed to be the most restrictive rules ever, in theory. That was the idea, you know, close up the field, make it more competitive. And yet you've produced the most dominant season in Formula One history. How? Um, I think certainly when first saw the rules in 2020 in their initial guise, then they looked pretty depressing from an engineering point of view and in as much as at first sight they looked very restrictive and the rules were freed up a little bit just to allow some visual differentiation if you like which I think is a very good thing um, and then once you get into it then whilst they all the boxes and the gradients of and, and so forth the exclusion zones um, are very prescriptive once you get into the details there's there's it became apparent there's actually a reasonable amount of flexibility within that and certainly in terms of the very visible side of the cars the the top bodies and of course you've seen that where at the start of last year there's a wide variety of solutions people have generally converged this year or through this year um but there's still a lot that can still a loss in the in the detail of the cars. What qualities does your car have that makes it so effective? I think when we were looking at the trying to understand not simply loopholes but also what was required to suit these regulations back in 2021, it was trying to get the fundamentals right. Um, trying to get the, the architecture uh, to suit the, the aerodynamic rules, um, suspension. So obviously we decided to go pull rod front, push rod rear, which was um, opposite to what most cars were in, in the, to the previous rules. Um, we felt that was what best suited the aerodynamic requirements of the car. So I think we, we managed to get the fundamentals of the car right when it came out at the start of last year um, in truth it was designed in quite a hurry so because we, we were battling with, 20, with Mercedes in 2021 and, and so we probably put m more resource than anybody else into the 21 car for longer um, for even our, than Mercedes? even than Mercedes I think Mercedes stopped a little bit sooner than us um, Ferrari didn't really do any development on their 21 car, they just broke 21 off and to, to do the research for, for this season, oh, sorry, for last season. Um, but in that compressed period, we managed to get, so I think we got the fundamentals right. Um, perhaps the bodywork wasn't quite as refined as it could have been, and that meant when we first came out, we still had a reasonable amount of development space in the car, which is perhaps what um, well, it, it allowed us to outdevelop Ferrari in our battle last year um, and then as I say the, the good thing about getting the fundamentals of the car right is that then that allowed us to take an evolutionary approach um, to, to understand the, the strengths and weaknesses of last year's car and try and address the and address that appropriately. And what has been key to this year's advances? Advances? Have you made like a big aerodynamic leap, or is it weight loss, or um, just certainly weight loss? Of... Certainly weight loss is part of it. We never managed to get down to the weight limit last year. Um, we, by the end of the season, we were still significantly over. So uh, much more detail through the winter to get um, to get the weight off. Um, and then the rest was, re was primarily. 
aerodynamic refinement. Is, this sounds like a ridiculous question given the level of success of the car, but I think you'll understand where I'm coming from because there are different ways of judging this question. Do you consider this the best Red Bull ever? <laughs> um, you know what I mean, right? Because you talk, you know, there can be innovation involved in that. There can, and all well, sorts I, th of I think best Red Bull. I think it follows a pattern in as much as um, RB5, which is the 2009 car. Whilst we didn't win the championship that year, it was a car that was then able to evolve into into the cars that did win the, the next four championships and indeed was the car that kind of if you like uh, most other people converged towards through that period and so it's, and, and that was also not as big a regulation change as, as, as um, this recent one but it's still a big regulation change between 2008 and 2009 so I think We've managed to read regulation changes. The, the last two big regulation changes of 2009 and 2022 well and come up with a car that we can then evolve. And is it your best car ever? I think best is such a subjective thing, isn't it? Isn't but well, right, I'll put it a different way then, the one you're most proud of. I mean, it has achieved the most success, but other people might look at the Leighton House or the Williams FW14B or the, the, 80, the 98 McLaren, for example. What about you? I don't, I don't really look at it that way, to be perfectly honest. I, I, I think um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be involved with cars that have had a good deal of success, as you say. Some of those cars have been um, as a result of regulation change, for most of them, to be perfectly honest. Um, and that's something I do enjoy. But I think also, of course, it's... it's Clearly, Formula One's not about simply one person, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Yeah, developing the developing the the team, the engineering team, working with that team, that's that's also been a huge satisfaction. Up and down the pit lane all year, especially as the seasons developed, a lot of people are asking one key question: How much is Max, and how much is the car? What's your answer to that question? I think it's impossible to put percentages on all of these things. It's, I think that's what makes motor racing in general and Formula One in particular um, such a fascinating sport. That it's to win championships, you've got to have that package of a, a great driver, a good car, and a good engine. And um, if one of those ingredients is weak, you might snatch the odd race win here and there but he won't win the championship how would you define max's qualities and how do you see him in comparison to the other two greats of this era or the last few years last decade or so like lewis hamilton and fernando alonso i think what i can say about i mean i've been fortunate enough to have worked with several great drivers and um whilst their personalities can be significantly different in, in how they conduct themselves, how they, their approach to things, little things like debriefs after, after each session, whatever, then they all conduct themselves very differently. I think the thing they all have in common is the ability to drive the car with a lot of mental reserve left. Um, so if you take Max and so his, you know, others I've been lucky enough to work with as well, where um, they're able to drive the car with enough capacity left over to think about how they're using the tyres, how the race is unfolding, when to push, when to not push. Uh, more, of course, now in particular with, with these cars, how to adjust the electronic settings to, to suit the handling of the car as it develops through through the race and that max is quite exceptional that now in terms of the team at red bull there's been quite a bit quite a few changes over the years you know you lost peter pedromu to mclaren for example you lost dan fallows your head of aero to aston martin not very long ago and now you've got a new team of guys underneath you um how do you work with those guys and how have you managed to con have you managed to maintain that level of success uh, and 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 quality of car engineering over that period of change? 
I think one of the things that certainly when I <coughs> first started at Red Bull, which was effectively the ashes of the Jaguar team, then um, it was from an engineering side, if I'm honest, a little bit dysfunctional in as much as um, the communication between the, the three main disciplines that make up any Formula One engineering team of aerodynamics, design office and vehicle dynamics. Uh, the communication was poor, they're even in separate buildings. So trying, uh, and there's a bit too much of a meeting culture and a bit too much of an email culture and so forth. So trying to make sure that everybody was well integrated good communications, try to run a very flat structure. Um, of course, any, any organisation you have to have an organogram, but try to run that as informally as possible. Um, and, and make everybody feel involved. And I think that is hopefully what that culture is something which we've, we've managed to achieve. And that hopefully, I mean, means that everybody who works with us enjoys the experience and, and, enjoy, and feels kind of empowered and, and, and creative and really Formula One on an engineering side is of course is the, it's, it's interesting because you, on the one hand you need to be disciplined um, particularly with this cost cap era where you can't you have to be efficient and, and well planned but uh, on the other hand you've got to embrace the if you like, slightly more artistic, creative side, because that's ultimately what makes the car go faster. So it's trying to get that culture um, embedded in the organisation. And, and, and as I say, generally speaking, we're very. it seems to work in as much as we've always had good results, but also we have a very low turnover. Of course, two people do leave occasionally. Um, Typically, it's the age-old problem that if, if not so much money, but another team approaches an office of more senior position, then it's, it's sometimes it's difficult to keep people. And I totally understand that, but I think generally people do enjoy working at Red Bull, and, and um, that if, if, if the people are enjoying it, then they've got a good chance of getting the best out of them. Could they do it as well without you? Uh, probably, I'm not the person to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Who should I ask that question to? Uh, I don't know. Delve into the organisation. Are you just being modest, Adrian? <laughs> no, I've, you know, I've, I've... First of all, I don't feel as if um, any, of the, any of the engineering team... I, I just enjoy working with them. Um, and, and I enjoy kind of, you know, trying to be creative, uh, standing at my drawing board, as everybody knows, and, and trying to come up with things. But also, and I very much enjoy working with the team. And I think that's the culture, as I say, that we, we try to promote and embrace. Is this the best team you've had at Red Bull, the best team of engineers? Yes, I think that is fair. Um, we've got an exceptional team of engineers now, at, at, throughout the at the various levels, from the very senior guys through to um, some of our kind of post grads who have joined straight from uni, or even some of the undergrads who are in their their gap year. Just talking about you and design for a minute. Is it true that you can see the airflow? <laughs> No, I, of course not. Um, but you but can, I, can you imagine the I, airflow? I can, I, I can picture it, and I think that's perhaps one thing which I um, uh, seem to be, if I, if I try to be objective, I think that's perhaps one of my strengths, is that I can actually um, picture things quite well in my mind's eye. Do you know, do you... It's hard for you to know because you can't see inside other people's brains, but do you recognise that as a rare quality? You work with a lot of engineers over time. Um, it's certainly not unique, of course. Um, 
we've got several great engineers now who who can also do that but it's I guess I think for me it's perhaps partly um, because I was lucky with my DNA and as much as my father was quite uh, math- mathematical and engineering thinking he, although he's a vet he was, had a, a great interest in in uh, maths and engineering and, and my mum's side was um, very artistic which is ultimately what you need that sort of combination of the creative artistic side measured with a, an engineering discipline and in, in, in analytical side and then kind of uh, perhaps as a result of not being or well, having relatively lonely long holiday summer holidays or, or school holidays I should say then I used to kind of um, ultimately start sketching out when I was 11 or so sketching out designs of racing cars and then um, making models by folding up bits of aluminium and making bits of fiberglass and so forth and whilst of course I had absolutely no idea what I was doing what I was unwittingly doing was developing the ability to picture something, sketch it and then develop it in 3D form and in this case making it physically as a model but of course it doesn't matter it's, 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 a, it's the process of them putting it into 3D which is the important bit so I think if you take that um, is it the 10,000 hour rule, something like that Yeah, then, I don't know whether then, that's scientifically yeah, proven but yeah, yeah 10,000 hours um, yeah. I was kind of in a very un, uh, unwitting way practising that from quite a young age Yeah now, now everyone's converged onto more or less, or nearly everyone's converged onto more or less the same aerodynamic philosophy. Can you say what people are trying to achieve with these cars? What's the undercut in the side pod doing? What's the fiddly bits on the edge of the floor doing, you know, in general terms? Uh, well, being, being Venturi cars, I mean, all cars are ground effect, but being Venturi cars, then it's, it's all about trying to condition the flow to give the, the best performance to the underbody and most of what you see is as always control the front wheel weight which is for any open wheeled racing car a big thing um, much more restricted now of course because barge boards aren't, ava- aren't allowed etc so you're trying to find other ways of controlling the front wheel weight um, and then maximising the, that Maximising the shape of the, of the underside really is, is, is the key to the, the whole thing. So why does the undercut side pod work when, for example, a zero side pod doesn't? That's again, I mean, it's, I don't want to get into the details. Right. Can you put it in layman's terms? I wouldn't say a zero side pod doesn't work. It clearly does. It, it, it's, it seems our side pod has become the more popular one amongst the pit lane, but not having really seriously looked at a so-called zero side pod I can't comment in too much detail I can only only look at what we've been pursuing and and, um, that's what we keep working at I think one of the things obviously that helped us is that we managed to come up with a concept from the start which people now seem to be converging towards and what's that has allowed us to do is is um, develop and evolve that whereas if you kind of have to how can I put it the best way to put it is that none of us have the resources to look at endless different solutions so early on you tend to end up going down a route and what you don't know when you go down that route is, and particularly of course at the start of last year where there are several, several different routes became apparent and the solutions that people had adopted which of those is ultimately going to be the better route because if you simply chop to another route and have a quick look at it it's undeveloped because by definition you're just starting down that route so you don't ultimately know which is going to have the the highest potential. Um, It seems that 
popular approach, uh, populace now suggests that our route wasn't too bad, but as I say, compared to, for instance, Mercedes route, I really can't comment on the details because we haven't properly ever looked at it. Do you think you hit on that because you'd done ground effect before, in the 80s? I think we hit on it for a variety of reasons, kind of trying to look at the flow physics and understand what we thought was required. But yes, also the the bouncing problem. Um, was, I was surprised that nobody really saw that coming, to be perfectly honest, because it's certainly a problem in the 80s. Yeah. Um, and I do remember, because my, my first job was in, as an aerodynamicist at Fitzpold, is a small Formula One team, um, whose technical director is Harvey Possethwaite. And with those ground effect cars in 1981, we he decided that um, because we were running the front so stiff, we could save weight by throwing away the springs and dampers and just substituting it with the bump rubber. And it was actually my first ever visit to a track as a uh, working rather than simply as a spectator for the test where you took that solution up to Silverstone. Keki Rosberg was driving the car and as it came past the, the pits at um, Silverstone, then the it was bouncing so badly that the front you could see daylight under the front front <laughs> tires, and that was a, that was a lesson that a on it was a lesson on how badly you could get it wrong and create bouncing, and that bouncing is not simply the aerodynamic shape; it's also how it interacts with suspension and indeed the stiffness of the bodywork. And you say, kind of certainly in that first test at Barcelona last year, then. It's very apparent people hadn't con- a lot of people hadn't considered that at all. Mm-hmm. Is it true that the flat aero platform of your car is is key? I've heard I've seen that written somewhere. Is it true that that's why the car behaves with its tyres in the way that it does? Again, I, I can't comment because not knowing the details of other people's cars, I only know what we've got. I don't know what they've got. Is that a correct characterization of your car, though, that you're looking for a flat well, aero platform? It's, it's, of course, something that we try to achieve, but I'm sure everybody else does as well. Yeah, OK. Um, are you surprised the other teams haven't caught up? Um, Especially Mercedes, for example, with all their resource? Mercedes obviously took a different route, and they have... I'm sure that if you took... The Mercedes of today and compared it to the our car from the first race of last year, then they would now beat us. So it is it's back to this thing of how do you it's it's it's, deve- it's concept versus development. The Porsche 911 is probably the best and worst example of that. Yeah. Do you think these were the right rules? Do you think the rulemakers got it right or wrong? Um, given their aims? I think the, the chief aim of the regulations, as I understand it, was to make overtaking easier to, by reducing the... Well, the, the, the theory is that if you reduce the aerodynamic wake of the car as encountered by the following car, air, overtaking will become easier. And I think in that sense, if you talk to the drivers, they do feel that overtake... They are... The following car is less affected by the, the lead car aerodynamically than it was, let's say, at the end of 21. So in that sense, yes, they have achieved it. Do you think ground effect's the right way forward for Formula 1? Well, all cars are ground effect. OK, but Venturi, Venturi cars. Venturi, let's put it that way, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, yes, I think they are in as much as... I do think Formula 1 should be about efficiency... And uh, We've a had Venturi many conversations car, about that yeah, over the years. Exactly. We? <laughs> and a Venturi car will always be more efficient than a, a flat bottom car. Yeah. Um, in terms of efficiency, what, are you, what do you make of what's coming in 2026 with the en- new engines and what the a- movable aerodynamics that, that have been re- required as a result of that? Well, yes, I think the, the 26 regulations are dominated by the, the change in the PU. Um, which makes the car very energy-starved. 
So the aerodynamic regulations then have to try to come up with a car that, that suits that. I think the, 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 good, the positive aspect of that is it means that really we need to come up with a set of regulations that promote aerodynamic efficiency. Um, and after all, why shouldn't aerodynamic surfaces be embraced as, as movable aerodynamic surfaces? You know, we've only got to go down the motorway now and you'll see various, lots of cars putting spoilers up and down and so forth. I think movable aerodynamics was obviously banned in the 60s because of, of accidents. That shouldn't be the case nowadays. So I think that's, that's a good way to go. Um, the devil is going to be in the detail and whether it, we can come up, whether there can be a set of regulations that um, compensate for uh, the peculiarities that say of the PU is, remains to be seen. Now, I'm aware we're getting to the end of our allotted time, but uh, can I ask you some personal stuff? You had a very nasty accident last year in which you broke your skull. Yeah. Did that, what effect did that have on two you? Did it, ago, was it two years ago? Sorry. Um, did you, I believe it was a, just so the audience know, you had a crash on a bike at night yeah. on holiday and headbutted a rock basically, didn't you? Um, did that change anything about you? Did it make you reassess anything about your career or life? Not really. I think I'm too pig headed and stupid <laughs> to do that. <laughs> no, I mean, I. Th- I mean, you're 65 now, Adrian, or you're about to be 65, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. and uh, you know, most people will be thinking of retiring at that point. You just signed a new contract. I don't know how long it's for, but... Yeah. Uh, um, well, retirement's a funny thing, isn't it? So, I, um, That's kind of the context of the question, I guess. Yes, it is. And if you'd asked me when I was 50 if I'd still be working now, I'd have said absolutely not. And then, of course, these things come up, and, and you think, of, I'm actually enjoying it, and what else would I do? I'd, I'd get bored lying on a beach. Um, and if I look at two of the people I most respect, which are Bernie Eccleston and, and Roger Penske, then I've both asked both who are clearly still working at a, a quite a ripe old age. I've asked them both, and they're still very mentally agile. I've asked both of them because I both know them reason. I know both of them reasonably well. Um, kind of what's their secret? And, and they've both said, "Don't stop working." You. Your brain, think of your brain as a muscle that needs exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do agree with that from other observations. Um, unfortunately, my father kind of, um, he, he retired at 65 and, and uh, kind of le- ended up a little bit kind of lost, I suppose, if I'm honest. And I don't think you'd mind me saying that uh, afterwards. So I am conscious of all these things. Equally, I, Formula One is it's, it's a very involving sport. And what I've tried to do is um, kind of say I, I, I still love it. It's, I'm, I've been fortunate enough to be doing what I wanted to do since about the age of 10, i.e. be a, an engineering in um, motor racing. So whilst I still enjoy it then I'd like to still be involved but equally I'm very conscious that I want the the engineering team at Red Bull to to feel kind of um, uh, responsible involved uh, and that I don't in in any way get in in the way of their own development aspiration so I I want to be try to be very balanced about that and also get involved in other things so obviously I've enjoyed the Valkyrie project, we're now uh, doing our own track car project. Um, we've got various other things. A submarine, I believe, is it? A submarine, I mean, my, mm. my, my personal involvement, if I'm honest, in the submarine is very small, so I almost feel guilty that okay. I'm, I've got my name on that. It's, it's not in truth, it's an advanced technology project. Um, but we are involved in lots of different things. We're doing a bit with. Um, Alinghi on the America's Cup which certainly I plan to get more involved, not so much with this cup but the following one so there's lots going on and I think what I really enjoy now is, is the variety that 
um, I, that is possible for me to be involved in. And I think that variety allows me to hopefully stay fresh and, and, um, and enjoy things. And just finally, you've had this incredible career. Um, you're admired around the world for your achievements. But are there any regrets, any drivers you wanted to work with, any things you wish you'd done differently? Well, clearly first and foremost is uh, to have had a longer relationship with Ayrton. Um, in terms of drivers, I mean, of course, there's, I guess, um, I mean, Fernando's one that I've always... You uh, nearly had him at one point. Yeah, you were so in a car came, at Spa Airport, weren't you, with him? And it didn't work out. <laughs> you have a good memory. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's a regret that that never happened because I have a tre tremendous respect for Fernando. Um, no, I mean, uh, the truth is, first of all, I, I kind of try to live in the present and the future, not the, not, not the past. Um, I, no, regrets, no. I think I just tremend feel tremendously lucky to have, to have had the opportunities I've had and to have, had the, uh, and to have worked with the people I have done and met the people I have done.